I'm Graciela Moskowski. I'm the direct, executive director of the Center for Community Media at the Newmar J School at CUNY. And we are very um, um, honored to have this group of um, publishers uh, and colleagues here uh, talking to us, us about how uh, they are covering the uprisings uh, in the country against police brutality. Um, we wanted to um, facilitate um, conversation to just offer this platform so people can share um, what they are seeing and what they are thinking um, and have a conversation around that. Um, our, um, uh, the conversation today will be moderated by Aaron Foley. Aaron is a 2020 JSK journalism fellow at Stanford. He's just finishing his tenure there. Uh, he's formerly, he was the editor-in-chief of Black Magazine in Detroit, and he was also the former chief storyteller of the city of Detroit, among many other things he's done. Uh, he's also an author. Uh, he has a TED Talk. He's, uh, he has done a lot of public speaking, and he's being kind enough to um, uh, accept a very short notice invite um, as the other panelists to moderate this conversation today. So I will uh, give you now um, the pass the mic, as they say, um, uh, met metaphorically, um, Aaron, and um, then he will introduce the, the panelists. I'm going to mute myself. If you have any comments again or questions for people who just joined in, please use the chat box. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Graciela, for the introduction. Um, here's what we're going to do. So I'm going to um, not uh, uh, talk long, but I do just want to set the scene a little bit. Um, it sort of goes without saying that this is a very climatic time for Black Americans in this country, um, but especially for the Black journalists who are out there on the ground, boots on the ground, um, sort of navigating their professional duty, duties with their personal feelings, navigating a changing industry, navigating the pandemic, obviously. Um, all of these things working and, and why we're here today is to ask um, Black media, um, what is the role here? Why, um, why are these newsrooms critical um, in, in the cities where this is going on, in the communities where this is going on, and just sort of open the floor to dialogue, concerns, what we're seeing and why these vo why our voices are relevant in this conversation. So I am going to go around um, in the order of my screen, ask each panelist to introduce themselves, tell, um, tell the crowd where they are. And each panelist is going to spend no more than 10 minutes just explaining what they're seeing from the perspective of their newsrooms, what their newsrooms are dealing with, um, as it relates to all of this. And then we'll turn it over to the crowd. Uh, once again, as Graciela said, um, if something jumps up, jumps out at you, please use the chat box to just drop in a question. Um, we'll try to make it as orderly as possible and respect everyone's time. But, you know, without going any further, I'm going to start with uh, Katrina. If could you introduce yourselves and, and tell us what you're saying. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katrina Lewis. Sorry, having headphone issues. Um, so I am managing editor for QCityMetro.com. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we are a digital uh, platform. We are hyper local, so we focus on the Black community in Charlotte, North Carolina. So on the ground, what we're seeing here, um, so our first uh, protest was on Friday. So we're on day, what is it, six, I think. <laughs> um, but that first night um, kind of caused a little, it caused a lot of conversation because it was, actually organ it was actually organized in one of the historically black communities. Um, and a lot of the notable activists, and not just the notable activists, but community, uh, Black community members um, were curious because, you know, people weren't sure who was behind it, and they were saying, well, if we're going to organize, why are we doing it in a neighborhood? Why are we doing it in the historically Black neighborhood where we know Black Lives Matter? <laughs> um, so that first night, um, they uh, marched and they went outside of one of the subdivisions of Charlotte's uh, police department. Um, and what we've been seeing is during the daytime, it is, you know, genuinely peaceful, um, things like that. But as sundown comes, um, that's when there is the 
um, moments between protesters and the police, local police. Um, the uh, consensus was that first night in particular that, you know, there were outside people who were kind of hijacking the peaceful protests to, you know, disrupt. Um, but since we've been, um, you know, over the past couple of days, that's what it's been. Um, I know that Charlotte made headlines, um, you know, Tuesday going into Wednesday because there was a, there's an alternative newspaper that's local here that has been live streaming the protests. Um, and they uh, captured footage where it appeared that um, the police department were firing chemical agents and things like that into groups of protesters that were surrounded. Um, so it's about maybe, maybe 90 seconds or so um, where you saw protesters coughing, um, trapped in so you saw them um, um going into a parking garage trying to get out of you know the way of the gas and things like that um the mayor yesterday uh had a had a uh, a called a, a press conference a virtual press conference to discuss that because obviously once that um stream went live um, and people start talking about it, they immediately were questioning, you know, CMPD, our local police department, and, you know, who authorized this, um, this is not okay, things like that. The community really wanted answers. So um, yesterday was the first of a community conversation. They called it like a front porch style. Um, and uh, according to the mayor, the, the intent was for city leaders to listen to the concerns and frustrations of uh, residents. And we were there yesterday, and it it they answered questions, um, but they were looking for assurances, things like asking city council and the police chief, um, will you guarantee that we won't be tear gassed, um, things like that. Um, to which he responded, um, you know, as long as there is no violence, there you will not be tear gassed. But it seemed like the protesters were looking for some guarantees or maybe different wording. Um, they have called in the uh, state's Bureau of Investigations to, in, to conduct an independent review of the footage. Um, so it's been, you know, that has been kind of tense. Um, amidst all of this, uh, as everyone knows, Charlotte was um, contracted to host the Republican National Convention. Um, so um, part of that conversation has been we are still under a we are still under restrictions as far as the pandemic. Um, we're in our phase two, um, where you know businesses are open at limited capacities, but our uh, mass gatherings are still um, for indoors ten people, outdoors twenty five people, and the president was wanting um, the state to guarantee a full convention. Um, so we have been, you know, going through that. Um, yesterday, it came, well, it came out that, you know, the governor said we, it's unlikely that we will um, host a full convention um, as was, you know, anticipated when the announcement was first made. Um, so, you know, that's also at the backdrop because that was already a tense um, conversation that was happening in the uh, Black community. So we have pandemic, we have uh, GOP convention, we have um, uprisings, but compared to um, other cities that I've seen, um, Charlotte has been, you know, there has been some, there's been some violence, but n n nowhere near I've seen as what I've seen in other cities where, you know, buildings have been on fire and cars have been on fire. We haven't had um, any of that. It's been arrests, um, it's been arrests and, um, yeah, so it's been it's been it's been um, a lot of conversations, um, but protesters have been you know pretty peaceful, um, just wanting to have their voices heard. Katrina, could you talk a little bit about covering um, what you're saying? Mm -hmm. So our team is relatively small. <laughs> um, it's two, maybe two and a half of us, um, but taking the approach of because we are we are an outlet that focuses on the black community you know the issues that are at the core of um the protesters messages so you know 
racism, police brutality, systemic, you know, systemic issues, that's not new to our platform, right? So there are certain nuances that we don't need to, it's almost preaching to the choir. Um, so, you know, we obviously covered the first night, you know, um, the NAACP uh, local branch, they uh, organized a, a huge um, uh, uh, protest on um, Tuesday and that drew thousands. So that was by far our largest one. So, you know, really getting, talking to the organizers, talking to people, why are they here? Um, what are they hoping to see? Um, people are really just, um, you know, now wanting to really speak up um, as far as us as being a black outlet, um, well, primarily black focused outlet, it has been, we have seen, you know, a lot of those voices of, hey, here's how you can support, you know, black businesses, black media, things like that. Um, and I think we're supposed, we'll get into the conversation later, but, you know, that has also been, you know, a separate conversation of community response. But as far as covering it, it really has been, you know, it's a small team and we really have to prioritize what stories that we're telling. Um, so yes, we'll recap it, but you know, what voices do we want to hear? You know, people who are first time protesters, people who lives have been um, impacted, um, but also, you know, the organizers, elected officials, you know, things like that. All right, thank you, Katrina. We'll definitely revisit some of those points a little bit later. Uh, next, I want to turn it over to Sarah, if um, you can quickly, same, same thing, quickly intro introduce and tell us um, coverage, um, what you're seeing, what you're seeing in your community and how your newsroom is handling it. Sure, thank you, Erin. Um, thanks, Graciela, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Sarah Lomax-Reese. I'm the president and CEO of WURD Radio. I'm kind of an outlier because we're not a publisher, but we are a media outlet, a Black-owned media outlet. Um, in Philadelphia, we're the uh, only Black talk radio station in the state of Pennsylvania, one of the few remaining in the country. And um, so, you know, we are a, a two-way talk radio station. And so uh, we have been really providing our community a platform to express their pain, their anger, their frustration, um, their sadness, their um, support, their uh, confusion, just the full range of emotions that um, our community is feeling uh, at this moment. There's, Philly is a very black city. We're about 44% black. Um, it has a long history of of talk radio and um, it's a very kind of conscious and activist city. Um, and so, you know, we, um, our listeners skew older. And so uh, one of the things that we've been really intentional about right now, because the, the people in the streets are the young folks. And um, so we've been being very intentional about centering the voices of, of young people on, um, on our airwaves. In fact, we're going to be doing a youth town hall next week to really amplify because um, what's the, um, the, the quote, I think Martin Luther King said, you know, the riots are the, the, the language of the unheard. And so um, we, we need to give uh, opportunities for expression and voice and to, to listen and, and to give uh, our, our community opportunities to be heard. And so um, we, you know, we don't have a traditional newsroom, uh, but our hosts are very engaged in, in the community on, on many different levels. Uh, we have uh, activists, uh, people who are community activists who are our hosts. We have folks who have expertise in uh, history and politics and, um, uh, you know, social justice. And so you know, similar to Katrina, you know, we talk about these issues all the time. We're talking about white supremacy and poverty and public education, the, 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 uh, the, the, the failures of the healthcare system and racial inequities and, um, you know, uh, wealth gaps and all of the things that are manifesting, that are, um, you know, coming into view in, in a very fiery way right now. Um, and police brutality, you know, can't forget that. 
police brutality. We, we talk about all of these issues because even though we are uh, focused on Philadelphia, obviously we are talking about issues of uh, black oppression and um, you know, just uh, police brutality, all of those things, criminal justice uh, inequities that are happening throughout the country. And so um, the fact that we, we are, this is kind of our wheelhouse uh, all the time, it allows us in this moment to do some self-reflection about what else can we do? You know, yes, we are talking about, and we don't just talk about the, the things that are wrong, we are also talking about the things that are, um, are brilliant and beautiful and, uh, and, and affirming in the Black community. I mean, our whole reason for being is to try and show the full complexity and diversity and brilliance and um, humanity of the Black community. Um, you know, we know in the Black press, we know in the Black community that, that the Black community is not a monolith. And uh, I think what, what is happening in the world right now with uh, this, this, it's really a global uh, uprising or a gro global awareness of uh, seeing George Floyd be murdered on, on camera was, um, you know, was, was, was so, um, was, was just so stark and, and brutal and callous. It, it, I think it, it is a, awakened uh, an, an awareness that has no kind of boundaries in, in terms of race or gender or, or, um, or any kind of whatever, whatever um, you know, what, whatever you see yourself as, I think that people could see from a human level that this was just unequivocally wrong. And, and so, and what black people have been wrestling and fighting against for centuries, really, for 400 years around um, things that were not captured on film, things that were not, uh, that, 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 that white folks could kind of sweep under the rug and say, oh, well, they must have done something wrong if the police killed them or did something to them. And what we're seeing right now is with Breonna Taylor, with um, you know, George Floyd with Ahmaud Arbery, with even with Christian Cooper in Central Park, it's captured on camera in full view. That's it's it's um, it's indisputable the the fact that racism and kind of these uh, these systemic inequities are are so um, stark and and obvious and clear. So that's what I think is is happening um, globally. But again, back to Philly. Some of the things that, that have transpired, my son is, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but apparently he's an activist. He is, um, he's been out in the streets doing his thing. Uh, he got tear gassed on, on Monday. Um, we call Philly the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection, not so much right now. We had a statue that was, that the, the protesters uh, were trying to push down of uh, a symbol of police brutality in Philadelphia. His name was, um, uh, Rizzo, um, Frank Rizzo, and he was the police commissioner of Philadelphia in the 70s and later went on to become the mayor. And he brutalized the black community um, while he was the police commissioner. They erected a statue of him, I'm not sure how many years ago, but several years ago. And this has been a cause of great um, conflict in the black community. And it, it was spray painted and, and um, try and set on fire and all of these things on Saturday. And um, we have been trying to get that statue removed for, for years. And yesterday it came down. Yesterday, um, the, the mayor in the middle of the night made sure that that statue was taken down. So, um, you know, amidst all of the, the, the destruction and the, the, um, the protests, peaceful and otherwise, um, you know, movement change is is actually happening and it's unfortunate that it takes this kind of uh, violence and and um, destruction to get the attention of kind of the powers that be um, to to actually begin to to make change the what we're talking about a lot now on WURD is how do we continue to hold these uh, stakeholders accountable and make sure that the moment is not a moment that this this movement is something that we can sustain and and uh, try and continue to create uh, systemic um, change amidst all of the all of the um, turmoil. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next, 
going to turn it over to Billy, who I know is had to change direction for this month's uh, issue of, uh, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll let him talk about it. Um, go ahead, Billy. All right. Well, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the inclusion in today's panel. Uh, my name is Billy Strutter, Jr., and I'm just about a month in uh, taking over as publisher of Black Magazine. And Black is a, it's a monthly print publication and online community that focuses on people, um, places, and issues of importance in Detroit. And it was, uh, what an interesting time to become a publisher. Uh, so we had the fortunate opportunity to uh, have not gone to print because we were digital for the last two months because we have a free distribution model for Black. And with everything being closed, we decided to go digital only. And in coming back to print, uh, we were fortunate enough to have a delay to where we were able to change uh, midstream uh, and completely scrap the issue to make it focused on what's happening today. And that's something that is pretty rare for a plant print uh, monthly publication. So we felt it was really important to highlight what's happening in the city of Detroit and what's happening around the country. Uh, so, you know, my background is in marketing. So, you know, owning a publication like this, what I recognize is that it comes with responsibility and that while I'm a marketer and entrepreneur, uh, I am not an editor or a journalist. So my role has really been to set the course, but get out of the way and really allow the editor uh, to do what they're really good at and what they excel at. And that's to be able to, to tell those long form stories. So some of the things that we've done uh, it, is even made an adjustment into how do we find more people who can go out and cover this event? So uh, in what's been going on in the city. So we've been sending reporters down to uh, do live coverage of the events. Um, we've been writing stories specifically for the web and then sharing uh, stories to our social channels uh, as both posts and as stories. And then we're also looking at uh, eight different pieces that we'll be rolling out. And what we thought it would be important to uh, further the conversation by looking at the perspectives of everyone within our community that, that, that's dealing with this situation. So uh, we have uh, an opinion piece that's written uh, from the perspective of an African-American police officer. Uh, we have a father, uh, a mother, uh, an activist, but we thought it would, uh, what would it look like to bring all of these people together and get their perspective on what's happening today? Thanks, Billy. Uh, sorry, Billy. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we'll do Morgan from the tribe. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Morgan Elise Johnson. I am co-founder of the tribe, which is a digital media platform that is reshaping the narrative of Black Chicago. Um, my personal background is in documentary filmmaking. I never thought I would be a publisher, but here we are. <laughs> um, I started the tribe with my really good friend, Tiffany Walden, after we were having debates with each other about who had the, no the most noble profession. And I'm like, documentarians, we take our time, we tell the story right. And um, we started to talk about the narrative of Black Chicago and how traumatic it is um, as people who grew up in and around the Chicagoland area. Um, it's really a traumatic experience to read the news here or to watch nightly news because often it centers Black violence in a way that doesn't reflect the realities that we know. So um, we, we really started the tribe with the, um, with the mindset that we wanted to repair the relationship between the Black community and the news media. So let's see. So we we started with mostly outreach events. So it's been very important for us to not only to tell stories through a black lens, but to bring everyone out of the comment section and together to have face-to-face -face discussions and for us to do some, some media education 
about like why we cover stories a certain way and how we find sources and also to ask our audience about the stories that they would like to see us cover. And so far that has really helped us build an audience over the past three years. We were founded in 2017. Um, with COVID and the uprisings, everything going on, um, that outreach strategy has really been disrupted, right? So we can't meet people face to face. We can't really be out in the community like we usually are. So we've been really strateg strategizing around how can we still uh, maintain that trust and build um, without being face to face. So far, we are a, a pretty small operation with a staff of five people. Two of them are reporters who we just hired um, and three more people will be starting this month. Um, but we also have a very enthusiastic group of contributors and community members who will just send us documentation, photography, footage. Um, we call them the tribe mob. So um, I, I would like to think that our relationship with the community has built that trust to where they feel like if they're out in the public and they notice something that they can capture it and send it to us and we can help them tell that story. Um, it's been difficult during this time to produce a large volume of stories because there's so many stories to tell. So what we've done is built a couple of pages on our site that do uh, daily bullet points and telling people about, you know, public health issues with COVID and also a page dedicated to the uprisings that give people daily bullet points of like, what are the movement moments? What is the government response? So that people can, can get updated and it's not too hard of a task on our team. Um, let's see. At this time, I guess I can also say that the community is really rallying around us in a way that they haven't before. Um, since Saturday, we've received about $10,000 in community donations, like new subscriptions, um, which is unheard of for us. So um, I think the way we've been managing things has really been um, beneficial. So we're getting such a positive response. Since Saturday's uprisings, um, we found it necessary to, to put a little bit of pressure on the government. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing it, but the mayor of Chicago is limiting, you know, uh, access to press conferences with really the excuse of, you know, safety because of COVID, but we're at a point where we really need to ask her questions and we only have access to a pool reporter who may or may not read our questions and will allow her to dodge the questions. So we've been trying to strategize about how we can get the answers that we need. Um, and it may require a collaborative effort from newsrooms around Chicago to be able to get access to press conferences again. Um, I think that in terms of how mainstream media tends to cover Chicago, it can be very unbalanced. So we pride ourselves in being the organization on the ground that's getting uh, firsthand accounts from community members and um, a lot of times the stories that are amplified really distort the narratives on the ground. So we also try to look at those narratives and come in and challenge them, correct them, sometimes directly on social media or whatever platform we feel necessary. I guess that's all I got. <laughs> Morgan, you definitely brought up a lot of talking points that I'd like to touch on uh, this afternoon. And just a reminder to everyone, um, if there's something that jumps out at you, I do, I do know there's some questions in the chat box, we'll get to them. Um, but if, it, if at any point, if, it, if anything comes up that uh, you'd like someone to expound upon, please drop it in the chat box. Um, our, our final panelist um, is Eleanor uh, from uh, the Amsterdam, Amsterdam News in New York. Eleanor, if you can go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, you know, 
what's happened over the last several days, uh, you know, we haven't seen anything like this in, in decades. And um, our reporters and editors are, you know, they live in all the different boroughs of, of Manhattan. We have uh, staff that are in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, and Manhattan. And they're seeing things going on everywhere. And they're out on the streets everywhere. Some of them are, you know, watching from home and looking out their windows. Some of them are out in the streets um, with it actually going on, with it going on. And what we're hearing, and it's happening everywhere, is that they're seeing the people having to beg with outsiders to not be violent, to not be breaking windows of their local community, uh, grocery stores and um, pharmacies, to say, look, we're here protesting peacefully. Do that in some other community. Don't do this in our community. Go, go do that in your own community. Don't do that here. We're not about that. We want to protest peacefully. And so what we're finding is that it's others coming into our communities to try to make trouble. And we're seeing this over and over again. And we're not seeing that covered um, the way we think it should be in other places. I mean, we're seeing these older women having to beg people not to come in and disrupt their peaceful protests. Um, and I find it really troubling that our communities are being blamed when in many cases they're not at fault. And you know, the difference between black newspapers coverage of these, these events is that we really are on the ground and, and telling these stories in a very different way because we do actually talk to our community members and we do actually see what's happening. And we have been talking to these community members for weeks, months, years, and decades. Um, it's not like we're just finding them for the first time. And when you see the main, quote unquote mainstream newspapers going into these communities, they're meeting all these people for the first time. And it's a, it's a very different relationship. The Amsterdam News has been around for 111 years. And uh, we have covered New York, and the country, you know, since then. And we have worked with black newspapers around the country and the black press has been, you know, the drumbeat of black America. And it is, it is interesting to see how, while the black press will begin the stories, the mainstream press will start to run with them and then get them so wrong in so many cases. Um, it's heartbreaking to see some of the things that are happening and again to see how our communities are then vilified when it's not necessarily our communities that are responsible for the violence that is happening. And um, I think that's one of the main things that our newspapers really have to make sure it is covered. Uh, and uh, we also have to make sure that we tell our stories correctly um, because we are the ones that are on the ground that are, that are there and that uh, know who to actually talk to because it's, it's quite clear that in many cases the mainstream have no idea what they're doing. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, uh, before we start taking questions from the audience, um, I, there's a question on my mind uh, that I'd like to throw out there to the panel because as I'm taking notes here, there's kind of a recurring thing. There are two things at play here that I see. There's um, a recurring theme of small staffs at Black Media. Those of us who have ever worked uh, um, in, in the field know that um, sometimes uh, reporters are also distributors, editors are also handling subscriptions, whatever the case may be, but um, having a small staff to cover such a, um, a large climatic event like this, 
Um, and also just balancing that with just trying to get the recognition that a mainstream uh, journalist or a mainstream publication uh, would have. Eleanor, you talked about this just now in terms of um, black press will often begin the stories, but it's mainstream that not only get the attention, but sometimes get them wrong. So um, if any of the panelists um, want to just talk about how do, how do we navigate covering events like this with such a small staff and what is the feeling like for for if anybody wants to expand more on that what is that like when you all are on the ground but um it seems like folks who like eleanor like you were saying folks who are meeting this community for the first time are and end up becoming the ones telling the stories here i'll i'll jump in um i'll say uh yes you have to really What's worked for us have been collaborations. Um, so just yesterday, um, when I mentioned about the uh, community conversations that was called, literally an email went out um, from the city about a notice at 4.30, you know, for a 4.30 press conference, uh, virtual conference about, you know, saying we're going to do the community conversations at six, you know, so I had to go there. Um, but yesterday, we also were hosting, um, along with the African American Museum here, a community conversation um, entitled, uh, I Can't Breathe. So we had Bakari Sellers on the panel, we had um, our Congresswoman Alma Adams, we had an image activist who has been on the ground at multiple uprisings. Um, you know, he was in Ferguson, he was in Brunswick, Georgia, he was on the ground in Minneapolis, um, but he's Charlotte based. Um, and then excuse me, you also had our uh, sheriff, who is also, we have a black sheriff in Charlotte um, for Mecklenburg County. Um, so those collaborations have really been a lot because it has allowed us, while we may not be able to turn, to turn out as much content, you know, minute by minute, because we're so small, we still get the visibility and um, also stay current in the conversations because we are partnering with this institution, our publisher, you know, is um, and along with myself, we're um, regularly um, on segments with the local NPR station affiliate here. Um, you know, because we are a Black-owned press, and they're they're we're fully digital, but there's there's also a Black-owned uh, newspaper in in Charlotte too. Um, now it's almost like it's kind of sexy to uplift the Black community. So a lot of the mainstream outlets have been doing, here's how you can support Black businesses and, you know, things like that. Um, I literally had somebody ask me, you know, what Black businesses should they look? And I had to frankly tell them we are Black, we are a Black-owned platform. All of the businesses that we feature are Black. Go to the website, scroll through, you know what I'm saying? Like you can discover things like that. So we've really had to um, establish those partnerships. Um, Glenn, who is our publisher, you know, he comes from, from mainstream media, so he worked at the Charlotte Observer, you know, he's been at Wall Street Journal, you know, things like that. And his sole reason for starting Q City Metro um, 11 years ago was because those voices were left out of community conversations. So really building those relationships from ground up. Um, you know, I'm newer to the Charlotte market. I've been here about five years um, and been in this role at Q City Metro for about two years. But, you know, my background is actually public relations. Um, so relationships is my, you know, that's my jam. Um, but it makes a difference when you are somebody who the community knows. Um, we've had talk, we've had, um, you know, community conversations where they have, where residents have expressed their hesitancy about when people not from the community or not of the community come in to report on stories. Um, you know, how the, you know, how that shaped. Um, so, I, and for us, um, you know, like Sarah was saying earlier, a big thing is we're not always talking about, only talking about what's wrong. You know, there was, you know, to acknowledge that the protests on uh, Tuesday drew thousands of people and, you know, there were no arrests reported and, you know, things like that, but their message was not only about you know, here's this strike happening, there's a message of perseverance and hope because this isn't new to our community. Um, so really collaborating um, of how we can get those conversations out still, that kind of balances the fact that we're not, you know, minute by minute, here's the updates, but it's also intentional because again, 
we're preaching to the choir. You know, it's not our community that necessarily needs to hear these new messages. Um, it's it's right. It's the, the mainstream ones, but that has given us um, elevated us as a platform for people saying, you know, this is why this this platform needs support. We're small staff. It may be because you know you know funding is always an issue. Um, you know, you can't be in multiple places at once. So you know having contributors or people who are just like, I was here, let me send you something. As um, another panelist mentioned, like that really is what helps us, but they know us, they trust us. They know that we're going to um, tell the stories and we're going to not only tell the destruction, but the, the, the hope because four years ago, we were also in this situation with Keith Lamont Scott. Um, so, you know, even back then, how, how the city responded, um, right now the community is like, they want answers because there was a whole, um, there was a whole conversation of what will be different four years ago. And people are saying, you know, we have many, uh, black city leaders, mayor, police chief, district attorney, things like that, city council members. Um, and they're, they're also holding them, their feet to the fire because they're saying like, you know, we're still looking for some of those things that you know we, we said that would be different four years ago so it takes a lot of collaboration um a lot of creativity um but we make it work we do a, a newsletter daily <laughs> um it's a it's a it's a task it's a lot but you know we have a responsibility um, particularly as black press in times like this to make sure that we are you know out there Anyone else want to jump in on the small sure. staff visibility? Sorry. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to add um, something about having a small staff because really we just hired our first reporters um, a couple of weeks ago. One started the day of the uprisings because we were just like, I don't know, man, you got to go now. So <laughs> it's like really adjusting on the spot. Um, I can speak to partnerships. The tribe has been a part of a couple, one around elections, one around uh, keep holding Mayor Lightfoot accountable, um, although they can be helpful because it allows for cross publishing and things like that, getting more eyes on our stories. They can also be stressful because it just adds an additional layer of communications that you have to do, which can sometimes seem more difficult than just like going out and doing the story yourself. Um, we have been lately pretty uh, suspicious about co-publishing, especially when it comes to sharing our on the ground footage with TV news. Um, we basically told them, uh, if you want our footage, you need to allow us on air to contextualize it because sometimes the way TV news frames stories when they're not there, we just don't agree with it. So we've been saying no to TV news unless they're gonna give us a voice. Um, we've also cultivated a space on our site called The People, where uh, it's a community op-ed uh, column. Um, so we, we've democratized the op-ed. We say like anyone can have an opinion um, if it's, if it's um, contributing to narratives about Black Chicago. So we walk people through like how to write and you know we fact check and do all types of things, but our community can also write, which helps with our capacity. Um, and overall, we try to really think about our own capacity when it comes to covering stories like day-to-day -day incidences of which there are a lot, especially with, the, with so much looting and incidences of police violence taking place in Chicago right now. So we try to think about like, what is going to be the main takeaway years from now? What are our children's children going to need to know about this moment? If other outlets are covering the day to day incidences, and they're doing it well, then we don't need to hit this note, we need to go find the story that's not being told and amplify that. Um, and I would also like to um, add, somebody in the chat had asked, is there an association of Black journalists and of Black publishers? And, and yes, um, there's the NABJ, uh, the National Association of Black Journalists, and there is the NNPA, which is the uh, 
the National Newspaper Publishers Association. So there is an association of uh, black publishers, which has been around for, for many, many years. And yes, we do share stories. Um, we do do stories together. And a, a lot of us, uh, when there are things going on in uh, cities across the country, we'll call each other and say, hey, you know, we see what's going on in your city. Can we? use your stories? Can we use your photographs? Or can, can we work on stories with you? And we do have collaborations. And that's one of the ways that we work on stories together. I, I've collaborated with several newspapers across the country on stories, and we've worked on stories together. We've even pooled money together to send reporters you know, across the world um, at times to cover stories. Uh, and so there is that collaboration and that's some of the ways that we have worked when we do have small staffs. Um, more of it needs to be done, absolutely. And uh, I think we're, some of us are working to do that more. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, here's what I'm gonna do. I am going to call on questions in the order of the chat and hopefully we can get to as many of them uh, before we have time. Um, Kizzy Cox, I know you asked, um, you know, with all the recorded cases of police killing black men, why do you think this case was the tipping point? I would like to, if, if that's fine with everyone, I would like to hold that question until the end. Um, I, I, it's a very heavy question, I think, but um, it's certainly a question that needs to be addressed. But I'm hoping to talk a little bit more about the newsroom slash media landscape um, first and, 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 and the role of the black press during the um, during all of this going on. Um, our next question, um, straight up question comes from uh, Carla Murphy. Um, do, Carla, can you unmute yourself or do you have permission to, I'm sorry. Yeah, hey. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to make sure that, um, I didn't know host had to unmute, but Carla, if you want to address some of you, I mean, ask some of your questions. Oh, goodness, I have to go back in the chat. Which one? <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, is there any reporting on the identities of the outsiders? Yeah. Um, from, from what I have seen and heard from my reporters that have encountered this, it has not, it's just been people that the community just has not seen before and that they have not known. And after the protest, they've disappeared. So it's just people that have come in for these things and they've disappeared afterwards. Yeah, um, in the city of Detroit, uh, they've been doing a, a great job at the uh, press conferences of announcing the cities that the people have come from that are outsiders. And that certainly provides a unique challenges uh, when you look at the landscape of Detroit, which you understand, Aaron, with you know the high insurance rates and all of that, we, we recognize that there are a number of people who live in the city that have addresses out in the suburbs. But even with that argument, we do recognize and understand that there are a number of people that are coming in from, uh, from other states to, to protest. And so it's been um, important that they have been sharing at least, uh, not necessarily names, but the communities in which these, uh, the people are coming from that are being arrested. Um, this is, uh, ooh, sorry, Sarah. Um, I think that to, to Eleanor's point, one of the things that we're seeing in Philadelphia is that the, uh, the mainstream press is not covering that narrative at all. The, the whole idea that there are kind of provocateurs who are um, instigating the violence and, and really being uh, you know, the most destructive in, in the communities. That is definitely something that is being discussed quite a bit on, on our airwaves. Um, so we, we haven't necessarily, I've seen coverage of it in other parts of the country like Minneapolis where they are doing a much more detailed deep dive into uh, exploring this in, in, in a very um, uh, clear way. But in Philly, we're talking about it quite a bit on, um, on our airwaves and a lot of our, our listeners who, just going back to the previous conversation, the way we deal with kind of a small nimble staff is we use our listeners, our community as kind of uh, on, the, on the ground uh, reporters, on the ground uh, communicators to 
to keep us abreast of what's happening in, in the neighborhoods. But there is definitely a, a feeling that there are outside people who are fomenting um, you know, the, the violence. Not to say in Philly that it's only outsiders. We definitely have people who are from the hood who are, you know, getting it in and getting sneakers and, you know, and, and hair at the hair, at the hair bar and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's not, I think that's the thing that's so difficult about this is that it's not one thing or another, you know, it's definitely not black or white. We are seeing lots of white young people who are protesting lots of people of color, you know, it's not just a black thing at all. It's not just young black kids who are, you know, wilding out and, and, and breaking stuff. It's white kids too. And it's, 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 you know, we can't just say that it's just outside agitators who are, who are um, enacting this violence. It's, you know, young black kids too, and, and young white kids from Philly too. So it's such a mixed bag. And I think that that's what makes this so powerful, but also difficult to, um, to fully, um, you know, to, to fully cover in, and, but fortunately for us, we have the opportunity to, um, to dive into it from so many different angles all the time. We can bring on historians, we can bring on, you know, elected officials, we can bring on young people and, and really um, dive in, in ways that um, I think other outlets, uh, general market or mainstream media outlets, uh, haven't been able to do or, or haven't chosen to do in the past. I would like to see the conversation expand as black media if we're going to talk about looting. Um, like, for instance, we talk about looting in terms of like poor people, young people stealing. We don't talk about looting in terms of what the government does, what police do when you get arrested and they can automatically confiscate your belongings. I would like to see the framing of stories dig a little bit deeper. So maybe we can have a wider conversation about when something is considered righteous and acceptable when people are protesting versus when something is deemed is, is vilified, you know, within our communities. Well, I would, I would just, I think that's a, a really important point. And that is definitely something that we have uh, been exploring, like the looting. Um, when, when we think about looting, we don't talk about the government. We don't talk about how the big corporations got all of the, you know, the, the, the money, the, the PPP money that was supposed to go to small, uh, small businesses. We don't talk about you know, the bailouts of the banks. We don't talk about capitalism as corporate greed and looting and, and, and uh, just, just, you know, just defunding by, by greed of important initiatives that would support um, addressing some of the, the, the systemic inequities. So I, I think that, you know, you're, you're dead on, and I know on, on our station, that conversation is happening. Um, it, it, but the other conversations are happening too, you know, but I, I agree, we need to be looking at uh, these, these um, the, the ways that, and not just now, but throughout history, how uh, this country, you know, was founded on looting, you know, this country came up in here and uh, stole the land right out from under the, the people who were here. So, you know, and it's, and it's progressed for, from, from there. So, yeah, I, I agree 100%, Morgan. I think this is a good segue into a question here from River Fields. And um, River, if you want to unmute after I read your question to elaborate, just in case something else triggered within you. But um, uh, River Fields ask, um, you know, we, we, we talk about the um, outside instigators. Um, why do you think this is not being covered? And if I could sort of just add on to that, I, th I think a few people touched on it, but if we could elaborate here. Um, why do we think the mainstream has not covered it the way we would cover it? Not as sexy a story for them, you know, because it, it's, it's not a narrative that they feel like going down. Um, it's something else that they have to explain. They have to try to figure out why it's happening. I mean, we all understand why it would happen. We understand why that would occur but they 
they would need to actually understand what's going on in our communities to understand why there would be outside people coming in to do things like that. And they would have to understand the entire dynamic of what's going on in this country more than they actually do. And I was uh, hoping I could jump in here. I'm Ron Calhoun from Cleveland, Ohio. And um, in Cleveland, I don't know if you guys know, but the uh, local media plain dealer went under. Um, they, um, they just decided to walk. But uh, what's important here is that uh, right now in Cleveland, they're not even talking about the looting or the, even the protests for that matter. They're, they're giving these glamour stories about how great uh, suburban whites are coming downtown. And downtown is an isolated area that they're trying to build up and bring back uh, uh, bring back the, uh, the white suburban money to uh, urban Cleveland. And they're, they're just reporting on how, uh, they're celebrating on how the uh, suburban community has come downtown to clean up all the broken glass and help with construction and totally ignoring what the whole problem is. And I think when you start to, to try to, uh, to justify talking about outside looters as opposed to inside looters and the, the main uh, local media here doesn't want to deal with that. They don't have the time or the inclination to even even uh, investigate that. How do you prove that? Um, and then a lot of people go on the arrest records. Well, we know that black men in particular are disproportionately arrested. So and if I'm a white cop and I'm defending the Cleveland Police Department building and this 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 black man is just standing there saying black lives matter, but you've got this white kid and all black with a with a, uh, 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 which, what do you call those things? A backpack full of uh, his own arsenal and he throws it at the window. And now this white cop knows that's what that guy is doing. Who's he gonna arrest? When, it, when, when, when that thing hits the window and the tear gas starts flying and people start running, he's gonna grab the first black guy. So you can't take a, a police report of arrest to determine that the people are from the outside and the inside. You're gonna, you're gonna have to do a deep dive before you can even come up with that information. And most of them wanna stay away from it. Hey, Aaron, um, thanks, Ron. It, you know, something that, that's really interesting is that, you know, when we think about uh, journalism and, uh, you know, even if we're talking about capturing news, that every person now has a, a device in which they can, they can capture something in real time. And, it doesn't escape me that, uh, you know, when you look at what's happening and how people are sharing content today, that uh, people are conscious of capturing who these agitators are and ensuring that people are able to see that it's not just uh, African Americans or young black youth that are causing issues. Um, and then, you know, I would even want to applaud uh, the local journalists in Detroit because not only are they reporting on the fact that there are people that are coming down from other areas, but they're also questioning that narrative as well. So there's some dialogue that's happening uh, about it so that we can at least come out the other side and, and figure out what a better solution may be for understanding who's doing what. Um, and it doesn't escape me either that when you look at how the protests started, um, that there were, um, that the shade of people as we've gotten longer and further away from the original issue has certainly changed. And you're starting to see that in some of the coverage that we're getting locally in Detroit. Um, I know we got lots of people from different cities. Um, the floor is open. Um, um, I'll, I'll, you know, as, as host, I'll, I'll, I'll keep things going and orderly. But if there, at any point, if anybody wants to jump in from anywhere else, I know we, we're, we're um, a little widely represented here. Um, you know, I, Zoom will never be easy. <laughs> but um, if, you, if, if you see a, re, a respectful opportunity to jump in, feel free. This is completely open. Um, Ron, you brought up a good point about what's going on in Cleveland. And I do want to just kind of see this idea um, um, before I move on to the next question, but you're absolutely right. Um, mainstream media in Cleveland is lacking. I just dropped in a link to the chat to the Columbia Journalism Review uh, for people who are not familiar with what's going on in Cleveland. Uh, they have literally laid off all their reporters from the Plain Dealer. 
Um, and I think they're down to four now. Um, the union was busted, all, all, all these types of things. But the idea I just want to throw out there is where um, some of the larger organizations lack, is there an opportunity uh, for, for Black publications, sorry about my cat here, um, to, to step up, um, to kind of add and provide that context? Um, next question here. Um, comes from Serafin, uh, Serafin Santiago. How important has um, Black student journalists become in covering protests? I'm not sure if anybody on the panel, uh, I think Morgan, you might have mentioned it, but um, does anyone have any Black student interns, uh, staff members, contributors, um, uh, helping you guys out with, with what's going on? Yeah, so our, um most recent um, group of interns just started, uh, I guess, last week, actually. Um, so we have um, our interns um, out there covering the stories. And, you know, it's, it's a great deal of help. Um, and again, you know, that question before of small newsrooms, how do we do our work? And part of that is help from our interns. And, you know, they come from all over the country. A lot of our, um, you know, right now, because of COVID, um, all of our um, interns are working remotely. Um, but some of them, and we've given them the choice of whether or not they want to go out um, and cover things um, in person or or remotely, but they've most of them have chosen to actually go out into the field um, in their respective cities. Because you know, a lot of them, I, mean, I think we only have three right now, and some of them that were um, interns for us during the year, um, the school year, have decided to stay with us for the summer um, because they did not have other summer plans because everything got thwarted again because of COVID. Um, but they are, they're reporting from wherever they are um, for whatever they're seeing and um, doing their reporting either from within their homes or from out on the streets, depending on what their situations are. Um, but it is a, a, an immense help um, to be able to have that relationship with the colleges and universities uh, and to have those, uh, those young people working with us. But, you know, the other thing is that it is not only um, students of color. You know, we have had uh, white students as well and Hispanic students and students of all colors and ethnicities as interns. Um, and I think that's something also very important to remember because the fact is that we are not going to get better coverage all over the place and better representation all over the place unless we have people that actually know how to cover our communities. And while I would rather have people that look like all of us dictating what's on the front pages of every quote unquote mainstream newspaper broadcast um, and every other type of media out there um, run by us, that may not be realistic. So at least if they're trained by us, they will be able to represent us better. For the most part, the tribe has not really been working with interns during this season because of the risk of COVID. Um, now with the uprisings, and the risk of gun violence in Chicago, which usually spikes in the warmer months, it, it was just really difficult for us to put young people in that position. It kind of feels like throwing them into the lion's den. We were working with a, a youth um, newsroom called The Real Shy from Free Spirit Media. And, um, you know, our interns, they're pretty much burned out just from covering press releases of, of COVID every day. I think it's really tough on their mental health right now. That's what, that's the feedback that we're getting from them. Plus just their energy of wanting to be directly involved. So just us trying to be like, hey, remember, like, go out, please do not participate in <laughs> the looting or like, you know, whatever. It's just really difficult to manage all of that. And, uh, for us, we've just decided to work with people who are a little bit more seasoned um, in order to capture this story. Yeah, we um, 
we similar to, to Morgan, um, we had um, some interns during the year. And I think too, um, right, with the students, there's still a bit of, you know, grooming and hand holding that they need that when it comes to some of these larger or more like to your point, like you want someone who's more seasoned, that just something you just have to weigh against does the pros, the pros and the cons. Um, and that's what we're seeing too, like a lot of the um, people protesting there, there are, they are younger and they are um, really wanting to be active in it and to, you know, you don't want to be on top of them saying, hey, you know, while you're protesting, remember to get up, you know, <laughs> get quotes from you or things like that, where it's like, um, there's a bit of training that needs to go on. And when time is of the essence, you kind of want somebody who can kind of like bang it out, which is why some of those larger pieces and things like that, it's, it's, it's down to those who are, you know, consider our staff. Um, we do have freelancers um, and contributors. And a lot of times they were writing more of those feature pieces, especially around black business. We've, we've done quite a bit of coverage around like black businesses and things like that. Um, where they, where it's, uh, the angle is different. So, you know, they can kind of spend a little more time with it, but, you know, some of these stories that get down to the heart of, you know, social justice and inequities and things like that, you just need a broader sense of, to be able to contextualize it. And, you know, you don't really have a lot of the time to spend training um, or spend, um, spend a lot of time with it. So I agree with uh, Morgan, where it's just, we made the decision to um, um, how we parse out our, our assignments. May I, I just want to quickly interject because I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on this call. My name is Lou Cespedes. I write for a very small newspaper uh, in Brooklyn, in East Flatbush, um, the Caribbean Times. I just wanted to pick up on some, some of the highlights that uh, have been mentioned uh, by Ms. Morgan and, and by Ron. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges that we have as uh, uh, me black media-led uh, organizations is that we don't really have uh, hubs or platforms where we can, you know, sort of like crowdsource our stories. I have, um, I have great difficulty telling the stories that are happening in at a very hyper local level um, because I'm completely dependent on the print version and sort of my own infrastructure. And so I think um, what happens in the media scape, in the digital media scape is that the void is filled by people that are not uh, pushing our narratives. And I think it's very important that we create those, kind, those kinds of spaces for ourselves because there are too many subjects to cover. And so, you know, Business is important. The, the, the virus is important. The synergies between the protests and the virus, uh, the synergies between uh, looting and businesses, you know, those are all important topics to cover. And I don't think that any one uh, outlet or any one, uh, media, uh, one, any one organization can cover all of that uh, information coherently particularly given the budgetary and staffing restrictions that we all face. And so until we create platforms that are, let us scale these stories and uh, experiences uh, from particular writers in, from within their own context, I think we're going to have greater and greater challenges of filling, uh, filling the, the, the media scape in, uh, in important sectors on important topics because our infrastructure is just not there, to be quite honest. I mean, I, I really would like to believe that we have the capability to sort of crowdfund and crowdsource these stories on much more sophisticated social media platforms that are run and operated by us. And, and that's, I think, we still have a ways to go to get there. I'm going to interject with something that's come up a few times uh, before we go into another audience question, but um, the issue of collaboration. Um, Morgan, I know you talked about it um, where you've had potential issues with it where, um, when it comes for TV news, um, but I, I can't remember who else, maybe it was Katrina who said um, uh, there are benefits to collaboration, but 
Um, anyone who follows um, the industry knows that um, a lot of newsrooms are moving towards a more collaborative models when it comes to producing content, uh, whether that's like a ProPublica um, model of sharing with local newspapers or even something like the New York Times, you know, reaching out to some of um, regional and metro newspapers and things like that. Um, is there space for collaboration uh, with Black media outlets with whether it's within black media or black media in, in mainstream. Um, I, I'm wondering if uh, a few people could speak to that, if, if willing. I, I can speak to, to it. We did a collaboration with um, two other black radio, black owned radio stations uh, last year. I, I named it the Black Media um, Consortium. Um, and it was uh, WURD, WVON in Chicago and um, KJLH, which is uh, a, a music station in Los Angeles uh, owned by Stevie Wonder. And it, they were, they're all three of those um, radio stations are black owned and actually led by black women. And so we did a collaboration with the, the idea that we were going to, um, one, of the, one of the things that we get all the time is that, oh, you're, you're too local, you're, you know, you, you know, you, we, we, we need a, a more of a national footprint. So we said, okay, well, we're gonna collaborate and we're gonna have three major cities, um, Philly, New York, I mean, Philly, Chicago, and, and LA, and we're gonna pool our, our resources and do a, uh, uh, create this partnership so we could go after some national advertisers. So we, we, we put this whole thing together and um, the national advertisers say, oh, you know, we, we buy our, our, our radio by local market. And so, so it's always like the, the, the line is always being moved. And so um, we did the, the collaboration. It was, it was successful in, 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 in one way because we were able to do this three city um, activation that uh, highlighted voices, black voices um, in, in all of these markets. It was not successful from a business standpoint because we never were able to get a, a sponsor who, who actually supported the the initiative um we uh we we said that we were going to try and do it again if we could get a sponsor because it's just um that the lift was so heavy for it to not have revenue attached to it it was um it was difficult to sustain but um we also are part of a collaborative in philadelphia called resolve philadelphia which is uh, about 20 or so different media news organizations throughout the city um, you know, mainstream, Latino, Black, the whole thing, radio, television, newspaper, um, digital. And so, you know, we share articles across that plat that network um, around it. It's, it's all around a specific topic around poverty in Philadelphia. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of collaboration actually happening in Philadelphia across the media ecosystem. And um, so we, we share articles, we share audio with with other uh, organizations and they also give grants which is huge you know i you know you know it, it it incentivizes your desire to participate when there's you know there's there's some some revenue associated with it and so they're not huge grants they're like maybe three five thousand dollars for different things but that definitely keeps people um engaged in a in a different way as opposed to it just being a, a nice thing to do to work together Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is AJ Woodson. I'm the editor in chief of Black Westchester uh, local media in Westchester County, um, covering the tri state area. Um, I'm kind of a one man army. I do a little bit of everything. I'm the chief cook and bottle washer. I'm the editor in chief. I'm the co owner. I, the publicist, uh, I do the publicity, the promotion, and the marketing. Um, a lot of so I don't usually have a team to do stuff. So in the area of collaboration, I've learned to navigate where it benefits me. The, the mainstream media, I have my boots on the ground like nobody else does. So when ABC, NBC, and CBS need something, and there's, you know, we had a corrupt mayor that was indicted and they needed some information and stuff, they all called me. You, you understand what I'm saying? So in that same, I've developed relationships with the local TV news, which is our News 12, a, a cable vision function and um, uh, USA Today sponsored uh, uh, Low Hunt is on our, our newspaper. And um, I've, I've established relationships. There are times when 
I don't have the investigative muscle to dig deep enough into a story and they will, I will kind of utilize them to, to, to get in there and get information that I can't get access to. And in return, when they have stories and they need somebody local, they need somebody to speak on something, I'm able to give them, you know, the, what they need. Um, they utilize a lot of my videos. I've been able to make stories big enough, stories they never would have covered. I've been make, I was able to make them big enough where it was an interest for them to cover and they credit me for breaking the story first all the time, well, most of the time, and the post, the post is even, um, the New York Post has even uh, ran a couple of my stories. Um, so that, that's, as far as collaboration, that's how I've been able to navigate it to, to, to my benefit. You know, um, I'm sure there's also negative aspects you don't get the credit for if somebody uses your work or something, but I've, I've been successful in that aspect. I would add, um, we also have been able to do some collaborations. We, um, and I credit that to our publisher, like, like, like you, AJ, before I came on, um, you know, he was a lot of the one man band also. So, you know, now with me, I can, with me here, I can, uh, he can focus on some other things, but, um, it really is about the relationships, but also understanding that don't just connect with us because you want the black, you know, the black story. Like I think a lot of times, because right, you have a, a lot of the mainstream media, you have the, a lot of times more resources than we do in order to cover them if you wanted to cover them, right? Um, and I'm very sensitive to the fact of, you know, you don't want to be the flavor of the month, right? Um, but the relationships that we have have been ones where there is that understanding of a lot of times it's other niche markets. So we have, um, it's called the uh, Solution Journalism Collaborative. Um, so you know that that's a partnership with the local Spanish language um, newspaper, um, the LGBTQ newspaper, um, the libraries, um, you know, things like that, where it is also um, uplifting voices from other underserved communities. Um, for that one, that particular topic is around uh, affordable housing. So, you know, that, that there is, and that's um, part of a grant, but like, you know, we're able to um, do certain stories and do some certain work that uplifts underserved communities. Because I think that's a, that's a big thing in Charlotte. There's a huge wealth gap here. Um, so just um, a lot of those voices just aren't you know, historically told because there is, I don't know if it's the, the South or whatever it is. Um, but I think there is a huge gap and a huge um, need for um, voices from underserved communities. So that, so a lot of times, at least when I look at things, you know, that's where some of those collaborations come in with, um, we were able, for us, we were able to get some grants this year that were particularly focused on underserved communities. So it's just, you know, being able to, how do you, how do you go after these opportunities? Because I think that is something that's traditional to a lot of our newsrooms is that, you know, if we're able to, um, how do we find those opportunities where we can get some of those resources? And for us, grants have been a huge help. And really lately what we've been finding is you got to ask people. Sometimes we just, it can be simple as put the ask out there. So, you know, we launched a membership thing, a membership program the end of last year. Um, and there are levels, but then there are like, just donate with, you know, whatever amount you want and people have given that way. So I think give like letting people know what it is that you want them to do. Um, but uh, really just, you know, building relationships and making sure that it's not something where, you know, they're coming to you only because, you know, you have the trust in a certain community. Um, because I would never want to be, be part of it, be part of something where, you know, your question, like, it's questionable to your community and your readers, can they trust you? Because you get in relationship with people who the community may have questions about. So um, I would say, yes, collaborations, but I think being mindful of the history of the partners and things like that. And I just want to add one thing. Um, 
I think partnerships are very helpful, especially with amplifying stories through co-publishing. Um, also for us, like we don't have much of a capacity for a data-driven story. So we do partnerships with outlets like the Chicago Reporter, who that's really kind of like their bread and butter. So it's like a really good exchange there. I would say that partnerships become more complicated when money is involved and it's not like an in-kind trade of service services. For instance, Chicago has um, an alliance called SEMA that we've recently pulled out of just because for me, it just wasn't transparent enough of, of like the structure of how the money is coming in. Um, the partnership, which is sold to people as an alliance of Chicago media organizations is really a Chicago, it is really a project of the Chicago Reader where they kind of manage all of the advertising dollars and relationships and negotiate all of that. And then was um, dishing the money out to us like, hey, we negotiated this deal with, with these um, advertisers and here's what you got to do. And so when I started asking questions like, okay, wait a minute, um, how can we as new publishers get relationships with these advertisers if you're doing all of our negotiating for us long term i just don't feel like that's something that can help the tribe grow and help our relationships so for some publications partnerships like that work where you're kind of like on the receiving ends of things maybe you don't have the capacity to uh to really do the sales portion of it but I'm the type of publisher where it's like, I want to see the money as it comes in. I want to be a part of the negotiations. Um, and those types of partnerships don't work for us. Sorry, I think this is a good segue into a question from, hold on, I just lost it. I believe it's Adashina Emanuel um, about being a black editor or black staffer at a non-black media outlet. Um, what can black journalists in those situations do to amplify the work of black journalists working in black media? If they use the stories from black newspapers, make sure to give those newspapers credit. I mean, that's, that's number one, because so many times they don't give credit to black newspapers when they find stories in the black press. And they really have to do that because you know so many times that we'll be the first on stories, and reporters at mainstream newspapers will find stories within black newspapers and run with them, and the black press will never get any credit for breaking those stories. Anybody else want to jump in there before we move on? Ask the question again. Is it what can the what can the journalists at the what can the journalists at the publication that's not black owned? What can they do to help black owned? Yeah. Black -owned? Well, speci specifically, black journalists at mainstream publications. What can those journalists do to amplify black journalists at black publications? I mean. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Katrina. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I think sometimes, especially like, and I can only speak to, I can speak to Charlotte. I think a lot of times it is, it is, Charlotte is very like a, you know, who, who you know type of city, that kind of thing. Um, and I think sometimes when you have people in those spaces can you bring others in those spaces? Because I think um, when I see stories that maybe um, you'll get a press release or something like that, if it is, you know, a story that you're going to run, but you already saw it in your, your, you saw it in other outlets. It's like sometimes you're not even on the mailing list or you're not on the distribution list of, 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 of certain things. So it's, it's, you, that could be a, a, some way to help. Um, I think, that, you know, do you, do you as the journalist have a relationship with those um, outlets yourself? Um, because like I said, like relationships, it's just, that's, that's my, my big, big thing. Sometimes you want to, um, 
you, you want to be in the know, you want to make sure that this, you're able to speak to um, um, those in your newsrooms to check them if, if they're, if they are, 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 you know, promoting a story or angling a story, framing a story that isn't helpful, not only to that paper, but that community. So I think one, you know, what is your relationship to those outlets themselves? Do you have a personal relationship with, you know, maybe the editor or journalist at Black um, outlets, things like that? Yeah, I, I would just piggyback on that and say, do you actually read those publications? Do you actually listen to those um, uh, radio stations? Are you familiar with, do you support them? Do you um, have a subscription or, or, um, but, or, or at a minimum, do you, do you, are you conversant on what they're, what they're doing? I think that's, that's like kind of low hanging fruit and, and more kind of, I guess, broadly, I think that in, in, in mainstream newsrooms, you know, there's, there's a little bit of an arrogance around the fact that, that, you know, they, they are the, um, the paper of record or what have you. And so pushing back on this, this presumption of, of ineptitude that, that I think sometimes um, white-led media organizations have around, uh, you know, black media or, or media that's, that's owned and operated or led by people of color. So um, I think that, that really trying to, to change the, um, you know, the, the, the narrative or the, the, and that's, that's difficult, but it's, it's just kind of like being attuned to these, these kind of dismissive, um, attitudes that can, can, can be, um, can, can, can live in those kinds of spaces so that they are open to the idea and don't see it as a charity or as a, you know, as a, as a paring down or something like that. Uh, moving on here to a question from Kizzy Cox, um, which is sort of also in this in this wheelhouse. Um, uh, what from the panel for the panelists? What is your advice for journalists working in mainstream media who are centering Black voices while trying to balance the need for impartiality? How do you do both while being true to the story? Um. <laughs> I love the question of impartiality because it's impossible. It does not exist. And I think if we can all just be honest about the fact that we communicate based on our own lived experiences and that we try to tell stories in a way that's fair, um, I think that that would be a good framework to work from. Um, I mean, I work from the inspiration of Ida B. Wells, which, you know, was clearly an activist, you know, documenting stories to, to really try to keep Black people alive when we were being lynched and tormented. And we're in a moment that calls for that type of journalism. If the Black press doesn't do it, then no one else will. Morgan, very well said. Um, I'm going to combine a few people's questions. Um, it's come up a few times, but, um, dealing with when journalists are attacked, um, I'm not sure if anybody individually has dealt with it or, or if anybody has dealt with it with their staff, but, um, I'm just going to pick out one from, uh, Richie Riera, um, you know, what about journalists when they are arrested, gassed and detained? Um, um, are, are, has, has, has any, any of the panelists seen any of that? And if so, um, you know, can you speak to what, what you've done in that situation? Are journalists more at risk? Um, there have been a number of stories recently, especially out of Detroit, where um, Billy and I are from, where um, a few journalists of color have been um, detained while covering this. Um, and now the now, now journalists are required to wear these huge, you know, media badges, um, identifying them as media uh, so that they will not be harassed by police. But even then, um, I believe at least one uh, journalist was still, you know, cuffed and, and, and pinned down and whatnot before, they, before her colleagues came and, 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 and 
explain the situation and then she was let free and then there had to be an apology and all these types of things. Um, I'm wondering if anybody could speak to that. If it's happened. Well, I mean, I, what, what I can say, I mean, um, in Philadelphia, there have been a number of, of journalists, they weren't necessarily black journalists who were arrested um, while covering the, the protests. Um, I did sign on to a letter that the, uh, that a bunch of media outlets uh, sent to the police commissioner to, um, to protest the, the treatment of journalists. This, this does not speak to kind of the added, uh, the ad added risk and, and burden for black, uh, black reporters who are covering these stories. But, um, you know, in, in Philly, we haven't had that, that double whammy of the race and the journalist um, piece, but, um, but it, is, it is really, really concerning. And I think, you know, for, for our team, you know, we have a curfew in Philly right now. You have to be, um, you have to be in your house by eight o'clock, eight, between eight p.m. and six a.m. And so we are broadcasting. We have shows that are on um, after after eight p.m. And so you know, just trying to make sure that our um, our uh, staff, our programming staff, and and hosts are protected and have you know identification and have uh, you know letters and and things that that, that will if they are stopped, if they are challenged, that they have some type of documentation that will show that they're affiliated with the, the um, with WURD. Um, but, you know, we haven't had an up close and personal um, uh, experience with, with it other than what I just described. This might be, this question was posed to everyone from Andrea Neeson, but I know Sarah, you've answered this in the chat and I wonder, um, and it might be fun for the whole panel to kind of jump in here. Um, what kind of feedback are you hearing from readers and listeners? And is there a generational difference between what you're hearing? I know Sarah, you were asked, you mentioned that um, WRD's listeners are mostly older. Um, if any other panelists can speak to what their audience looks like, are you hearing different things from different age groups? Um, what, what is that like? I, I mean, I would say that our print publications readership tends to be older and our web audience tends to be younger. Um, and, you know, for the most part, they're still just thanking us for being there. And, glad that we're still there um, and uh, hopeful that we'll be able to continue to publish, especially in the midst of everything that's going on with COVID. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's one of the biggest issues right now that's affecting um, our newsrooms. Um, while all of this other stuff is going on right now, um, the fact that all of us are still even here and, and publishing is, is, is huge. Um, because of the fact that um, you know advertising has you know, almost completely dried up, and um, it has been very very difficult, and our our readers um, are are seeing that, and they're just glad that we're able to to survive right now. I've seen that quite a bit. Um, I think for us, it has been, as far as feedback, similar to what Eleanor was saying, people are just, you know, grateful that there, that there are platforms that exist that they feel will be authentic to the Black community. Um, I think by nature, um, when I came on, part of it, part of the, part of the reasoning was because um, we didn't have an outlet as one that focused on Charlotte's black community that I felt spoke to, you know, my peers. Um, I'd be, I'm a older millennial, but I'm a millennial. Um, um, and so we didn't, we didn't have that. Uh, and I think because I was just plugged into different networks within the city, um, you know, people started that started bringing them on. So now when they see us 
in these different spaces, they, they look to us because they know that, you know, Katrina's there or, you know, like I said, for a long time, Glenn ran this kind of as a one man band. So, um, and he came from main, from the mainstream daily that's in Charlotte. So, you know, a lot of people um, just, you know, know him for that, that institutional knowledge. And, you know, he's just been here, been around for so long. So I think there is, we do have a intergenerational mix. Um, I think it speaks to, you know, you have intergenerational voices on your team. Um, so it follows along those lines. But like she said, it, they're, they appreciate just that they feel like they have a platform that they can trust to tell the stories, the multifaceted stories. It's not just doom and gloom all the time, um, but it's, it's true to the different, um, different takes that happen in our community. All right, so we are reaching a point where um, I know several people might have to leave, have other meetings they need to jump in on. I do want to uh, point two things. One, I know we have ha had a lot of questions in the chat that we did not get to. Um, if, any, if anybody wants to write to the panelists directly, um, I'm sure we'll have some contact information. Um, but I, there's one question I really want to get to, and that is from uh, Charlene Robinson about, uh, hey, I, I, I see you on the screen, perk right up. <laughs> um, Charlene, I'm gonna ask you to, <laughs> can you, if you can please unmute yourself and ask the question that you asked about Rodney King. I, and I'm, the reason why I'm asking you to state it directly is because I don't want to misinterpret what you're asking, so I'm just gonna ask you to ask it in your own words. Sure, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, you, um, I believe it was Eleanor who said that Mainstream media tends to kind of jump into our communities and take a, a story and just run with it. And um, at first, when I kept, my question was this touchstone of not since Rodney King have we seen blank, you know, this much involvement or this much passion. And, and at first I thought, well, yes, this is a historical moment. And then I'm starting to think, especially as I listen to you, Black um, representatives of the Black press and how you're, you're so uh, attuned to what's local, um, it's almost as if the mainstream media said there's been 28 years of amnesia. And so I'm curious, when you tell your stories, are you also saying, uh, is Rodney King your touchstone? Or do you find yourself kind of pushing back on that um, it, when we're talking about this particular moment uh, with George Floyd? Um, you know, at least with us, we're talking about every moment. We're talking about, um, every single police killing that has gone on. We are talking about every single incident that has gone on with uh, of racism in general that has led to this moment. It's not one particular touch point. It is every single one because this is not a moment of one thing that has happened that has set this off. It is a culmination of years and years of of, of, of oppression basically and of um, and of violence that has happened and that continues to be perpetrated against our communities and in New York City for instance I mean you know Eleanor Bumpers, Amadou Diallo, Sean Bell, Michael Garner I mean the list goes on and on and on so those are all touch points for us and they, you know, <laughs> I can't breathe. We've heard, you know, New York, we've, we've heard that <laughs> too many times. Yeah, I would caution anyone from simplifying the narrative like that because there's just so much erasure and especially erasure of, of police violence against black women um, so we want to make sure to give visibility to that, but also just like framing it in a way that talks about systematic oppression and not the narrative of like these bad cops did this bad thing here in Chicago 
you know, where we have a policing budget that is about $4 million a day when our kids can't even get funding for school. Like it's an atrocity and we really need to talk about like why we put so much money in policing and who they are protecting and who they are serve, serving. Yeah, we, we try and put it in the context of, you know, 400 years, you know, and, and, and it's not just about police brutality. It's not, it's not just about George Floyd. It's, you know, it's not any kind of individual um, example. It's, um, it really is, as, as uh, Eleanor and Morgan said, it's really a, uh, a system of white supremacy and, um, and racial um, subjugation and oppression that goes all the way all the way back um, to the, the founding of this country. Um, one of the things that, that we are trying to do as a result, as a reaction to this particular, this immediate moment is to create like an intergenerational on air book club type of thing where we really want to um, explore the, the, the stories, the, the, um, the history of protest and activism and um, uh, within the Black community because we need to understand the context, we need to understand the history, we need to understand that that this is absolutely not <laughs> new, it's not unique, it's not um, isolated, that it is, uh, you know, this, this, the, not just the, the oppression goes all the way back, but the, the um, responses, the, um, the protests and the activism is, 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 there's a continuum um, for that as well, that young people and old people and all people can be inspired and, um, and, and uh, I guess, um, can, can learn from in, in very tangible ways. So we wanna, we wanna make sure that, that we're providing as much connective tissue and as much context and perspective about how big and wide and deep this, this thing actually is. All right. Well, I think um, I, I apologize. I did not realize I was keeping us past time. Um, for those who don't know, I'm on the West Coast. So I was my, my, my Eastern time difference was all over the place here. But I do want to thank everyone for participating. Thank you to our panelists uh, for offering their very valuable insight. Um, so many ideas came out of this that um, I think we'll be taking back to our individual newsrooms, our individual experiences, um, as well as when all of this, um, as all of these things continue to develop, um, I would highly encourage everyone here who is not in the Black newsroom to please um, consider your role in amplifying Black voices, amplifying the work of Black journalists, and especially the work of uh, Black media. I think it's come up several times that uh, we are doing the same job as everyone else, but we don't always get the amplification that is uh, so deserved. Um, so I would just plant that seed with everyone. Um, the, this recording, uh, this, this call was recorded, so it will be shared with everyone afterward. Um, I think, um, Graciela, if you want to talk a little bit more about uh, CUNY and, and what's in next steps. Yes, I just, I don't want to keep you any longer. Thank you so much. You've been here for an hour and 45 minutes. We usually keep it to an, an hour, but we thought this conversation really re demanded more time and required more time. Uh, a lot of people in the chat and privately and publicly are asking for more of this. So we, we're, we would be very happy to facilitate more of these conversations and include more people. We are sending um, a newsletter that we send every two Wednesdays. So it's coming out next Wednesday. Kavita, who's the, the editor, uh, is, is here. She's been um, listening to this conversation and she's um, gathering. We're going to do a special uh, feature, a special report on black media and the uprisings and the protests. So if you have any information, I just uh, um, um, added her um, email in the chat box uh, and our email uh, for the Center for Community Media as well. If you have any information you want us to carry in that newsletter, we have thousands of people receiving that newsletter nationally, including funders, by the way, for the <laughs> editors here and publishers. 
and um, and also a lot of other community media uh, leaders and reporters. So if you have anything that we want us to share, including uh, coverage that you're very proud of or resources that you know of or resources you, you can, you know, or, or connections you want to make, anything we, please reach out to Kavita and we'll try to include it. And, um, oh, there, there it is. Thank you, Jehangir. And uh, for all of you who know us, the Center for Community Media is part of the um, public um, school of uh, the, for CUNY, the, you know, um, City University of New York. It's the uh, Newmark J School, uh, the public university here. And we try to offer resources for uh, media outlets serving communities of color across, across the country. So we, we have, I also invite you to go to our website. We have a lot of resources available. And the last thing is we can connect you if any Anyone here needs access to lawyers because you or your staff has been detained and you need free, free lawyers. I know there are some other organizations offering this, but we are connect, we're trying to connect um, a network of uh, clinics, legal clinics, uh, to offer this support for free if your reporters need that, or in terms of uh, information, access to information, FOIA, um, um, you know, um, immigration issues, etc. We, we can connect you to those resources. So more of that will be in the newsletter. And um, finally, and we'll be sh we will be sharing this recording with everybody who um, attended today. So you'll receive it later tonight. Thank you so much. You're free to go. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs>